The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. And welcome. We have one case will be submitted this evening. That case is the estate of Paul Derrick or Dedrick Gray by Brenna Marie Gray versus uh, Daniel Baldy and others. Mr. Stoltz, you may proceed. May it please the court. Bruce Stoltz appearing tonight on behalf of the estate of Paul Gray. Estate Paul Gray died on May 24 of 2010. He was survived by his spouse, Brenna Gray, and she was pregnant with their child, who was then born six months after his death. This case presents a question of medical malpractice and the application of statute of limitations relating to the bringing of a, statute of a medical malpractice case. What happened in this case was that Mr. Gray had various um, drug addiction problems. He was seeking medical help and had sought medical help for some period of time. He ended up dying. And the question in this case is whether or not the medical personnel, doctors and hospitals treating him had committed any medical malpractice relating to it. The um, issues really split into a couple of different areas. First, there is the estate and Brenna Gray, uh, their claims under the estate, and then there is the claim of the minor child, ODG, who was born uh, six months after Mr. Gray's death. And it's our contention on appeal in this case that different theories of statute of limitation and different theories apply to whether or not uh, this case was filed appropriately within the statute of limitations. Under the Iowa Code, the uh, counsel, uh, yes. the position you're taking in this case uh, with respect to the child's claim would require us to reverse uh, the Doe versus Cherwitz case, would it not? Uh, to the extent that that case held that um, the, the, a child who was not born at the time of an injury to the child's parent has no loss of consortium claim later um, after, the, after the child is born. Uh, would, would, we, would we have to reverse Doe? I do not believe you would have to reverse Doe, Your Honor. Why not? In this particular case, you have a number of, of statutes that are involved in defining the rights of the minor and the issues of, of the right to recover in connection with the case. So, for example, the, the um, child in this case became a, is a minor, and the Dunn versus Roseway case holds that this child is a minor. And it is said that a minor is a person, whether born or not. And that was a specific holding in Dunn versus Roseway, Your Honor. Um, in fact, if we look at Dunn versus Roseway, we can, uh, which was a 1983 decision, the court specifically held that it is one thing for the legislature to say that a wrongful death recovery shall accrue to a person's estate. It is quite another to allow a parent to recover when they are deprived of the anticipated services, companionship, and society of a minor child. In the latter situation, the deprivation does not necessarily relate, relate to the child's birth, and the parent's loss certainly does not vanish because the deprivation occurred prior to birth. To the deprived parent, the loss is either way. In so, other words- So your position is if, if, the ch if the parent has a claim for the loss of an unborn child's consortium with the unborn child, that the reverse necessarily is true. Is that your position? That is correct, Your Honor. That is correct, and, and um, what the court said in the Dunn versus Roseway case is, is that 
Um, they defined, they used Webster's New International Dictionary to define a minor. And in this case, the statute refers to the minor's right to bring when the minor can bring the cause of action. This plain def it said, defines a child as an unborn or recently born human being, fetus, infant, baby. The plain definition is not changed by the addition of the word minor. A minor person is simply one who has not yet reached majority, a category which certainly includes unborn persons. According to Webster's International Dictionary, the word minor is derived from the Latin minor, smaller, le less, inferior. A consideration of the meaning of the words minor and child strongly support the plaintiff's claims. So the, the question becomes in this particular case whether or not it makes any sense to talk about the fact that a parent who loses a child, a minor child, has a claim for loss of consortium, but the, the child, whether the child has a loss of consortium that is going on um, when the child is born. It is one thing for a child who is not born. So if you have a fetus who is not born, then the fetus does not have life. But in this particular case, this child has life. This child, no matter how you define life before the child was born, this child was born six months and currently lives. And every day, lives without her father. There is no father around her to support her. There is no father to see her at her birthdays or to be with her at Christmas. But that the, is but what the loss statute, of consortium the, is. The statute seems to limit uh, the, the definition by declaring that um, it's, it requires an action to be brought on behalf of a minor under the age of eight years when the act of negligence occurred. It depends on the way in which you construe the statute. And when you look at that, the question is, is what the goal was to be obtained. And you look at the words that were used, Your Honor. When you look at the statute, the statute says that it is to be brought on behalf of a minor who was under the age of eight years when the act of mission occurred. Well, if you define minor as being a child who has been conceived, not necessarily born, but conceived, and is then born alive, that which is what the Dunn versus Roseway case explains, then you have this minor bringing an action before the child is 10 years old. In other words, you have to be under eight at the time you lose your father. If, if, you, read, if you read the definition of majority, and that's in chapter 599, majority doesn't refer to person. <laughs> It doesn't refer to child. I mean, the definition is a period of minority extends to the age of 18 years old. I mean, so it seems to me that it doesn't matter if the child is living at the time of the act or is in utero at the time of the act. That would be correct, Your Honor. It's irrelevant that the, the status of the child, that is, and that's what Dunn versus Roseway said, the loss is the same. But no matter what the status is, whether the child was born or not born, as long as they're conceived, the concept is they're a minor, and therefore they have not reached the age of majority. Now, in this particular case, you have to be under eight years of age. A minor, a child, a fetus, is in fact under the age of eight years at the time Mr. Gray dies. That minor did file the stat this lawsuit prior to the time that minor reached the age of 10 years old. Therefore, the terms of that statute have, in fact, been specifically and explicitly met. Now, the district court interpreted the word minor to refer to the fact that the child had to be born at the time. And it is our contention that this child, while a fetus, is a minor and is a, a person who, in fact, is an anticipated and has a loss of consortium. Remember this, the legislature, looking at this particular issue, when the legislature passed this statute, the legislature was, not, was looking at trying to give children who are under the age of eight an extended period of time 
in order to bring a statute of limit their, the, the lawsuit. Isn't the phrase a minor who was under the age of eight years when the act occurred, isn't that kind of an odd way to refer to someone who wasn't born yet? Well, first off, Your Honor, I think that would depend on how you defer, define minor, and we believe the Dunn versus Roseway case is very good evidence for the fact that you define minor to be a fetus. But it's referring, when it refers to minor, it's referring to the word minor at the time the lawsuit is brought. This minor, in this case, minor gray, was under the age of eight at the time the lawsuit was brought, or the action occurred in which the medical negligence is alleged, and what the action was brought by Tan. It was the way the legislature chose to state it, but there's no reason to believe they intended to do anything different. Can it really be said that the legislature intending to give a minor child, a child a right to an extended period of time to file a medical negligence case, intended that a child that was one day away from being birth would have to bring the lawsuit within two years, but a child that was born one day when the father died would have until 10 years. I, I agree with you that that is sort of incongruous, but it, another possible interpretation of what was in the mind of the legislature is they didn't even contemplate that folks that weren't born yet could bring these kinds of lawsuits. It would be the language and the intent then that the court would rely on, on on trying to accommodate what the legislature was trying to do. There are many, many times these things can happen. And this, these statutes, when you're talking about minors, remember there are many times that a parent may, may, the woman may become pregnant and the man may have to leave. Military men may have to leave. The concept is, is that, that just because that child hasn't been born, they have various types of protections because the consortium is going on. Mike? And therefore, it's within the, we, our contention would be it'd be within the intent of the legislature to help those children out just as they do the others. My understanding of the legislative intent of this statute is to cover the incident where a baby is physically injured in utero and through anoxia or some other birth injury but you can't detect this injury until the child re doesn't reach certain milestones. And the purpose of this statute was to uh, make sure that if there was a physical injury inside the uterus or, or during birth or before birth, that the minor child had enough time to <coughs> discover the, you know, the parents had enough time to discover the injury so they could bring it. And I think the thought was the legislature within six years are going to know if there's developmental delays or not. And I'm pretty sure that was the intent of the statute. But the question is, how does that relate to a consortium claim um, uh, in, in that regard? I mean, was the statute intended to cover the consortium claim? Well, the statute of limitations have to be construed, Your Honor, to cover all claims at some way. In other words, Minor children may in fact have claims in which they have been injured, yes, but minor children may also have lack of consortium claims. So the, it would be, it seems incongruous to think that the legislature would say a minor child has to bring their cause of action within two years under one particular defined type of situation, but has to do it in a, in, in a in, and can do it in 10 years otherwise, it would make sense that the legislature was thinking, we're trying to help minor children and therefore we're going to give them the benefit of these extra statutes. No, I think no one will, will argue, and if you read Whitehall versus Mose, no one will argue that if a baby is born, I mean, if a baby is injured in utero, whether it be by a medical negligence case, a car accident, an assault, that if that baby's born alive, that baby has a cause of action for the injuries they received. And Whitehall versus Moe says, if they're not born alive, you can't bring the action. So born alive is the, is the timeline, not viability. So my question is, what would, you, what would cause us to interpret this statute, um, physical injury versus non-physical injury for that kind of situation? 
I mean, did, did the legislature intend it to be for non-physical injury, for consortium type injuries? There is nothing to indicate otherwise, Your Honor. There's, no, there's nothing in the legislative history to indicate that, there, that they didn't intend to give the child those kinds of, of, of rights. Why, why would the legislature really be trying to parse it that way? And if they really did intend to limit the child's rights, couldn't they have used words such as physical injuries to the child, injuries limited to the child, injuries that in which this child was specifically injured and not consortium? In other words, the legislature didn't. There's nothing in here to indicate the legislature used any specific language other than broadly saying minor children are given these rights and those rights should be construed reasonably relating to that so that they apply both the consortium claims for losses that they have as well as to physical claims that may happen to the children. And so it could be that there could be divine different kinds of legislative uh, intents in intending this, but there's nothing, there's nothing from the legislative history to indicate that, and there's nothing that would indicate that this in fact is not uh, covering loss of cons consortium claims, Your Honor. So it, is it your position then the legislature intended uh, for the, uh, the statute to begin at the time of conception? Well, that would be a reasonable interpretation if the, de if the determination, because at the time of conception, Your Honor, the statute says the minor who has brought the lawsuit because the lawsuit, when the child brings the lawsuit, the child has to be less than 10. So the child is less than 10. What, was that child less than eight at the time they were, that they were, um, uh, the act or omission occurred against the parent? And this child, at, as of the time of conception, would be less than eight. And therefore, they, it would start less than eight, that is conception, all the way up until the age of eight. Yes, Your Honor. Well, and my with, time. with the language, I mean, our, our objective is to construe the intent of the legislature and to look at the language that the legislature used and then to use that language to come to your conclusion. I have a hard time um, finding my way there. If I may, Your Honor, you to change, actually to reach the language differently, you actually have to not go along with the language of the legislature. What, unless you're going to specifically say that they meant that this child has no cause of action until that they have nothing they can do until the day they're born. And then it becomes a question of whether or not equal protection would protect that. Why would the legislature say that a child is one day from being born should get less protection than a child that is one day that after would, birth? That was answered in Weddell versus Mose. There is no equal protection argument. But the, legis the, the court did well before the statute that you had to be born alive to bring any injury. So that might be the safeguard you're looking for. Because Weddell versus Mose will not let an unborn fetus bring uh, action for injury, a, a fetus not born alive. A fetus that and, that's would not the line, and that's the line we drew in Weidel's, but in Weidel's versus most. But we did say an unborn fetus, if they're injured in utero, has a cause of action. So it continues. It continues, and this this claim continues along with that same theory. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Mr. Hoke. I please the court. My name's Eric Hoke. I I'm with the Finley Law Firm and we represent um, multiple defendants in this case, but I'm arguing on behalf of all defendants. Um, we'll, we'll not rehash the facts. The courts read the briefs, they understand yeah, the let me, let me just start here. I mean, this might be simpler. Do you, do you agree that if this baby was injured from a, a tort feather while it was in utero and had either brain damage or anoxia or some other injury that once this baby was born alive, there'd be a cause of action? Um, I'm, the cases that were before the court, I'm not sure they would preclude that, but as the court was touching upon earlier, um, we don't believe that the actual cause of action before the court, a loss of parental consortium, um, would accrue. I'm talking about physical injury. Uh, physical injury, perhaps. Well, is there anything in the law that will not allow it that you know of? I mean, Whitehall versus Mose talked about it, 
and said that there is a cause of action as long as they're born alive. Um, I am not aware of anything that would preclude a cause of action for physical injuries. So what in this statute, you know, the statute doesn't preclude that. What in this statute differentiates between consortium and physical injury? I think the starting point needs to be whether or not there's a cause of action to begin with, and then if there is a cause of action, then is it brought within the applicable statute of limitation 614 1 sub 9. And so I think the threshold question as to whether or not there's actually a loss of parental consortium to be subject to the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations, no matter how it's construed, um, cannot create a cause of action. But, but Whitehall versus Mose said there is no cause of action. Tr trust me, I've tried these cases and I tried to create a cause of action for these unborn children. I tried a contract theory, I tried tort theory, I tried any theory I could, and Whitehall versus Mose and the cases, and you'll probably see my name in them when you start looking at them, said that there's no cause of action for an injury to a child in utero unless they're born alive. But once they're born alive, they're allowed to receive damages for everything that was caused to them in utero. And, and my problem is, is how do you, and I, I agree, there's no cause of action for this baby when it's in utero unless it's born alive. But, but my question becomes, how do you differentiate between uh, physical injury and, um, and non-physical injury? Because even in a physical injury case, you're allowed to get pain and suffering and lost wages and everything else. I, I just think it goes back to whether or not um, you have a cause of action to begin with. Um, in this case, there is no loss of parental consortium claim to be subject to the statute of limitations and so we don't get to the issue of, of physical damages. That's I mean, other, I mean, I didn't see it in the briefs, but I got on the computer this afternoon, and it looks like there are a number of other jurisdictions that recognize loss of consortium claims by, uh, on behalf of children who were not born at the time the parent was killed. I think a number uh, I think of the Wisconsin, Florida, Massachusetts, New Mexico, I think some of those um, jurisdictions also have legislation that define a unborn child as having rights to bring those kinds of action. And we don't have a similar statute in the state of Iowa um, that would define a unborn child as, um, as having the same rights as a born child to assert those actions. Um, we certainly don't have that in the state of Iowa. And there was a case that was recently decided in Connecticut um, December uh, 31st of 2015, um, not in our briefs, it was um, decided afterwards, it was not binding, it's not reported, reported as of yet, but um, that is the um, case of Murillo v. George, it's 2015 Westlaw 9920782. Um, it, it addresses a very similar context in which um, there is no specific statute. Um, mom was pregnant, dad died, children, the, the child was born alive afterwards. Um, under similar statutes that we have here in the state of Iowa that have been talked about with Weidel v. Mose and the non-survival or the fetus being born alive has a, or not being born alive does not have a, uh, a cause of action under a survival statute, um, concluded that there's no parental consortium claim. Well, counsel, I'd like to go back to, I'm sorry, did you have a follow-up? Um, I'd like to go back to a case I raised uh, with opposing counsel, and that's the Dunn versus Roseway case. There we recognized a consortium claim on the part of a parent for the loss, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the loss of the consortium with the, with the uh, unborn child. Uh, why wouldn't the reverse be true? If, if, if the loss of consortium, consor consortium, ship, uh, consortium remedy protects the relationship, is what I'm trying to say, the relationship, if the relationship is protectable from the parent running to the unborn child, why isn't the reverse uh, uh, also relevant, at, at least at the time the child is born? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure that it protects the relationship as much as the um, father in that case's interest in having a relationship with the child and having um, society and loss of consortium. So that case is different because um, the child was um, in utero 
was killed, but the father was alive. He had an ex the court in that case reasoned that he had um, a type of expectation interest, and it didn't matter if the child was ever born or not born um, alive, but he had an expectation that he would have the lost consortiums. But the, the, the difference is, is that the father was a human being alive that would have some type of cause of action that he could maintain. The difference is, is that the unborn child in the Rose v. Uh, or the Dunn v. Roseway case is that the child was never born, it never had the cause of action um, to assert. So it's, you can't, it's not upstream and downstream. I think it's only downstream with the father in that situation because the father was the only person alive at the point that could have a cause of action. You know, didn't, don't we recognize a cause of action for a parent for loss of consortium for a minor child in this state? Say that again, Your Honor. A parent have a law, uh, an action for loss of consortium of a minor child. Uh, yes. We recognize that, right? Yes. And if you read uh, Rule 1.206, that's the, the rule where it emanated from. Although Rule 1.206 says parent to child, we interpreted it to mean child to parent also. So we do sort of have a statute that recognized it, um, which would distinguish your cases. Um, I, I think the statute does say parent to child. Um, it, it, it is a different situation when you have an unborn child in this. In the if you read the case where we said it goes the other way, we said there's no reason not to go the other way under that, under that rule. My other question is, what was the legislative intent for passing this eight-year statute of limitation? Or six year, whatever it is. Uh, the legislative intent uh, for sub B, um, it was to provide um, uh, relief for a child to be able to, to attain the age of 10 before a cause of action would be filed on their behalf. But why would the legislature let it go to whatever age it does in the statute? Uh, probably to give time for the um, whatever harm to manifest itself and so and be able to accrue and understand what the what the cause of action would be so my question to you is why should it be different for physical injury and non-physical injury um, it I think it's different because there was never any cause of action to begin with that accrued in favor of um, ODG in this case for parental consortium your, your claim is not based that the statute extinguishes it. Your, your claim is that there never was a cause of action for loss of consortium in utero. It's two part. It's the first part. It's actually in reverse order as it was briefed. The first is that there never was a cause of action. And then two, there was no um, cause of action to be, I guess, saved by the applicable sub B of 614.1 sub 9. So if we were to find the cause of action, you'd sort of be out of luck. If we were to find a cause of action, I think you could still argue that um, it, the, uh, the uh, non-born uh, fetus at the time the cause of action, I guess, would have accrued at that point. It wouldn't technically, technically be a minor because the um, fetus would be um, have a negative age and in theory could not be considered a minor and therefore subject to part one. Minority is not defined as person or child, it's defined as something that hasn't reached the age of 18 in Chapter 598. Let me, let me switch gears there because no one's really talked about it. Um, you know, we have the case where it starts to run from the date of death, the discovery rule, which is for the, the yes. mom's claim. Um, we used to have that for personal injury in, in Dawson versus Schulte. And we sort of overruled Dawson versus Schulte or lessened it in the Rastri case. Why, why wouldn't the same reasoning of Rastri apply to a death case and if it doesn't why if it doesn't why shouldn't it it's a good question your honor um, I think the simple and short answer is that with regard to death with uh, talking now about uh, the statute of limitations that death is unambiguous just as in the Schultz decision have has indicated there was a three-part analysis where this was considered already by the court um, the difference is is that when you have the wrath G analysis in the court has struggled as with other courts over the course of time is how to define an injury for purposes of accrual of the statute of limitations in a medical malpractice case. After it goes through its analysis, it realizes that um, there's a separation that, the, uh, that can occur between the conduct um, and, and the harm. And part of that uh, analysis stems from the fact that injury has been hard to kind of 
wrap the mind around and to define is a bit ambiguous. Death, on the other hand, is not ambiguous. <clears throat> um, the court has considered this, like I said, in the, in the Schultz case, and um, um, since there was no ambiguity in the term of death, there was no statutory construction to apply to um, add in terms like the uh, plaintiffs did in that case to insert wrongful before death. In this case, they're trying to insert. Isn't it sort of inconsistent, though? It's not inconsistent, Your Honor, because in one situation, you have a ambiguous term injury, and what does that mean? In the other situation, you have death, which is not as ambiguous. If you do not have an ambiguous term of a statute, it doesn't need to be statutorily construed and give meaning that the legis legislature didn't write. Let me give you this hypothetical. Uh, a physician um, or anybody injures somebody, a physician because it's malpractice, a physician injures somebody, they're treating them uh, with a drug. The drug is overdosed and they end up laying in a coma for two years, which is an injury, and then three years later they die. So under your rationale, it seems like they could bring an action for the injury if they didn't discover the cause of the coma until a time limit, but they couldn't bring the death component of that. Now, does that make sense? Um, it does make sense. It's a kind of a two-part deal um, with the statute of limitations. You have one, which is do you need to discover the injury and its cause in fact, and two, the outer limit of that is death. And so if death is the outer limit, it's well, also subject to the statute of repose. But if you have death, that you have two years from the date of death to investigate. So there, there are two separate inquiries of what you'd have as to what the um, time you could be to bring But what action. if you found out three years afterwards, can you still sue for the injury, part three, component of the damages? Three years after death? Yeah, three years after death. Could you, under your analysis, it seems like uh, the person can sue for the two or three years they were in a coma because they discovered the coma was caused they didn't know the cause then, but at death, we have a different analysis, and that doesn't seem what the law should require. No, I think death would be the end point. That would be, two years from death would be the end point of what you had to bring your cause of action. Now Counsel, I'm sorry, finish your answer. Are um, you finished? Yes. Okay. Um, let's assume, just for the sake of, of discussion, that uh, we disagree with your contention that it's a, it's a flat two years in the case of death, and let's assume that the Rath G analysis applies to both death and injury cases, just for the sake of discussion. I know you don't agree with that. But, uh, so, so assuming that's true, now let's, let's look at, the, at the, uh, the causal connection prong of the, of the knowledge requirement. Um, in this case, Mrs. Gray uh, filed an affidavit in support of her resistance to the motion for summary judgment, saying, I didn't know that there was a causal connection between Dr. Baldi's uh, acts or omissions and my husband's death. At the summary judgment stage, we are supposed to view the facts in the record in the light most favorable to the party resisting the motion. Why isn't that affidavit of Mrs. Baldi enough to engender a jury question on the knowledge of causal connection prong. If we accept the premise that knowledge of the cause and fact of the death is a requirement and there's, there's a disputed fact as to what she knew or didn't know at the time, then summary judgment would be difficult to obtain. You, you may sum up. <laughs> um, we believe that um, <clears throat> that the uh, that the uh, statute of limitations um, it's not ambiguous. The court's been down this road before with Schultz. Um, it's a it's an analysis that holds true. Death is the same now as, as death as it was then. Um, there is no um, reason to overlay an analysis that was done under the Rath G line of cases, trying to figure out when is there an injury. Is it the um, physical harm is physical harm plus knowledge of cause and fact. That's a separate analysis that doesn't apply to death. Death is plain. It's been on the books for 25 years. People have been abiding by it. It's stare decisis. It's shaped the behavior of plaintiffs, would-be plaintiffs, defendants. Um, and to change it now when there has been no change in the law as to death would be um, inappropriate in our
Thank you, Mr. Hoke. Mr. Stoltz, you may present your rebuttal argument. Thank you, Honor. Hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, could I ask you to kind of pick up where uh, Mr. Hoke left off? In other words, what's ambiguous about the language the legislature wrote that we need to follow, which says uh, the claimant has to bring suit within two years after the date on which the claimant knew or through the use of reasonable diligence should have known or received notice in writing of the death. Uh, isn't it crystal clear that your client, Ms. Gray, knew of the death more than two years before bringing suit? It is true, Your Honor, that Ms. Gray knew that her husband died um, more than two years before the lawsuit was filed. But the the statute has more language than what you left, that what you read, because the words, the injury or death is in the statute. The injury or death is just, that phrase exists, the injury or death. And there is, and this court- but this is a lawsuit for the death, right? Correct, Your Honor. And, and also the statute goes on to say, whichever of the dates occurs first, first. correct? Correct, Your Honor. So I don't know how that argument helps you, does it? Yes, it does, because when in the Rathji case, the words, the injury, which is in the same four or five letter words in that same phrase, were interpreted to mean that you need both knowledge of the injury and causation. You need to have some concept of causation in order to be able to fit within that. To say that death, so it says when the statute says injury or death, but so, let's say, uh, suppose in this episode, suppose Mr. Gray in, in, uh, had survived or sub in, in that case, then, then the, the concept of whether, when, when, did, when was, did the injury become known, isn't it true that sort of the, that the injury incorporates some notion of causation? In other words, you may realize you've suffered harm, that was the, certainly the case in Rathji, but you don't really know that you've suffered an injury until you know that somebody's caused an injury to you, right? Well, there, I think that the, the I read Rathji, anyhow, where we read Rathji is, is that there has to be knowledge of a connection of the injury to medical care. People can become injured for many reasons. There has to be knowledge under Rathji that it's connected to medical care. But and, the, and the same thing is true for death. And when this court summarized the Schultze case, the court presaged this argument. Because when the court, this is what the court said um, in, in summarizing Schultze. Instead, we observed, reading, referring to Schultze, the discovery rule was generally inapplicable to wrongful death claims because death from medical care is the type of event that should give rise to the duty to investigate a cause of action. And it is true. If you have a death and you have the concept that it is from medical care, then in fact, the two-year statute of limitations would run because you have both death and causation. But doesn't that cut against you though because you know, when you have an illness, you know, you're concerned about treating the illness, getting better, and doing all the things that go along with it. And, you know, you want to get the cause, but you're really not concerned whether it was caused by a physician or a bad meal or whatever you want to deal with. But when you die, there's no longer any reason to worry about the, you know, what happened because you're not trying to get it better. And couldn't the legislature as Justice Mansfield said, that when you die, you got two years to figure it out or you're done. And, and I think that maybe the old case where we said death, the two years starts to run, and the Rathke case may be consistent with each other because of the nature of the injury. I mean, how, how would you tell me I'm wrong? Or tell me I'm right? I believe, Your Honor, we believe there's a difference between it. We believe there's a, the, that, that just because somebody dies does not be, mean that they know or have any reason to believe that the death is a result of medical care. 
legislature but, says start looking, and that's what the case said. You just read it. But the legislature also said two years from the date of injury, and this court interpreted that to mean that you also have to have some you have to have some knowledge that your injury was related to medical care. Well, but counsel, in this case, didn't didn't uh, um, Mrs. Gray uh, know that her husband died of an overdose while he was under Dr. Baldy's treatment? Why didn't that death start the two-year clock running then? She, the fact that he died of an overdose does not necessarily mean that, the, that there is a connection to the medical care because medical, people receive treatment for injuries for all kinds of things, Your Honor. They're always getting medical treatment. And what this court is saying, if the court holds this, then what the court is saying, and I guess it can be said, but it, it doesn't seem logical, that every time somebody dies, the first thing that people have to start doing is obtain all the medical records and they have to examine whether or not it's connected to medical care. That doesn't make any sense. There should be something that leads a person to believe that it's related to the medical care and somebody dying of an overdose does not mean that you necessarily believe that there has been something going on with the medical care. It's just that they're taking medications. There are all kinds of innocent deaths that occur, and there are deaths that occur because of medical care. To say that everyone who dies, that every executor has to be told, get the medical records, hire experts. The whole idea of RAFG was, people don't necessarily understand when they have to get medical care. They don't know, have to understand when connections, they don't have to go out, they don't know they need to go get experts. They should not have to get experts until there is some reasonable basis to investigate whether there's an injury caused by medical care or, and, to, and or, when, or death. When she knows it's an overdose, she knows Dr. Baldy was a treater, uh, why isn't two years enough time for her to figure out, get to the right lawyer, find if there's an expert to support their case? It why is, shouldn't she start looking uh, it, at the time of death? Your Honor, it is not that two years isn't enough time. Two years is enough time if she knows that the overdose was a result of the medical care, not as a result of other conduct, such as him taking the drugs. So he need, they, need, you need, they need to deal with the issue. Does it relate to the medical care? People have surgeries, and they go home, and they have problems. You, the issue is, is there some relationship that goes on? Is there something? And that's what juries decide. And that's what RAFG was intended to say. So Let's is, let is juries a, decide these things. The in, whether she was on inquiry notice to start looking at the time of death, a jury question or a question of law? For example, let me suggest an argument to you. Was she um, perhaps not so eager to look to Dr. Baldy because autopsy results showed that this patient died of other drugs, not the ones he prescribed. Of illegal drugs. That's correct, Your Honor. And Street to, drugs. And to, to, to follow up on that, when a, person is take, when a person is a drug addict, and this gets in more into the facts cases, when a person is a drug addict, they may take legal drugs and they may take illegal drugs. What is the responsibility of the treating physician to enter contracts, to do blood testing and all of that? That requires detailed analysis and understanding and the experts are not and the, the people lay people don't necessarily know they need to go out and do that investigation and the concept is once they have a reasonable understanding that they may have to do that then the law should require them to do but that. But isn't death different from a case where you have an ongoing patient relationship, they're adjusting the medication, they're testing the blood levels, a, a threat of a lawsuit would disrupt their uh, relationship, but death is final. Why shouldn't she start looking right then? Um, we can require everyone to do that, Your Honor. We can require that everybody has to do that. That doesn't seem to be the rationale of RAFG, that we have to require Isn't that. Isn't that what the to... legislature required? I mean, rationale of RAFG or not, isn't that what the statute says? Our contention is that's not what the statute says. The statute says the same thing that it says, Your Honor, relating to injuries, and that is, if you have an injury and you believe that is related to medical care, you are then on duty of inquiry and you have to sue within two years. If you have a death and you have a reason to believe that it is due to medical care, you have a reason, a duty to investigate and bring your cause of action within two years. But if you're, you have an injury and you do not know that it is related to medical care, 
then you do not have to bring it until, the discovery, until you discover the connection of causation. If you have a death and you do not know that it is related to medical care, you do not have to bring the cause of action until you have an understanding that it is related to medical care. And I would agree, Justice Waterman, someone could argue that knowing that someone overdosed taking medications may in fact be held to be sufficient duty to, in, to inquire. That is a little bit different than the actual argument that is being made because that is factually based on the factual issues and could be decided either Steve, by a I jury ask one final or question before we adjourn. Could I ask a question? And, and my question is when we decided Schultze, we interpreted the statute, we said that it's consistent, that it's a two year, pretty bright line <coughs> statute of limitations. Obviously the attempt here is to extend the discovery rule to death, which we've never done before. Also in Schultze, we had authorities from other jurisdictions that do the same thing that we did in Schultze, and we've never changed that. We've changed it a little bit with the discovery rule in, in the other case, but is there some groundswell of authority and other, you know, throughout uh, our nation here that says that we're now extending the discovery rule to death cases different than what we decided 25 years ago? I didn't really see anything in the briefs that said that there's some groundswell that we're now going to extend the discovery rule to death cases like this. And is there? I don't, I don't know of a groundswell of, of authority on that, Your Honor, but every groundswell starts with well reasoned opinions from great courts. Thank you, Counsel. <laughs> Thank you. Before uh, adjourning court this evening, let me just uh, make a comment or two. Uh, every case uh, tells a story, uh, a story where justice is sought through principles of law and, and statutes that are formed over time and are found in a, in a process that is itself uh, fair and just. And it is a process of, that you have witnessed uh, tonight and this is one that has served us all very well as a state for a very long time, and it will continue to do so uh, tonight in this case. We will uh, make a decision that will uh, follow. You might expect it uh, perhaps sometime in, in May, uh, but no later than June. And it'll come in the form of uh, a written opinion, and if you want to follow along, we uh, file our opinions every Friday, and then opinions that will be filed on, on a Friday are listed on the website uh, every uh, Thursday. Now for those who participated uh, tonight uh, know quite well the honor it is to participate in the system of justice and we uh, also hope that those who came tonight to witness this process will leave uh, enriched by what they saw and better for the experience that they observed. So we thank you very much for taking your evening uh, and spending it uh, with us. We look forward to uh, greeting you and meeting you at a reception on the second floor of this building in the, in the, uh, the light court. So with that, I would ask the bailiff to adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.